Good evening, church family. As you can see, things are a little different tonight, but uh, so blessed to have you join us for our Good Friday service. Also want to welcome anyone who's tuning in online. Um, really good to have everyone here tonight. Um, so yeah, we're going to do things a little different. We're going to have a short message, but as we go along through the message, we're going to have times of worship, times of reflection, and even a time for communion as well. So, um, 2,000 years before the crucifixion of Jesus, there's a story in the Old Testament that in many ways points us to the cross. And as you all know, we have been at church on Sundays looking at the story of Abraham and following his life. And last week we saw the promise to Abraham fulfilled, that promise 25 years in the making, that though his wife Sarah was barren, she would have a son. But once the boy grows older, God puts Abraham in an extremely difficult situation. Listen to it now, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So if you're familiar with the story, you know that God is testing Abraham here to see his faith, to see if he's willing to give up that which is most precious to him, his only heir, his son Isaac, to demonstrate his faith and his commitment to God and I'm sure we can all imagine the enormity of his grief in that moment, especially those of you who are parents, the, the grief, the sadness, the inner turmoil that would have been going on in Abraham's heart. How could he give up the son that was so precious to him, the son who he loved? There's a deep darkness in this moment. Now, though the text doesn't totally spell it out for us, I'm sure Abraham himself was in a very dark place. Yet despite this, we are told that Abraham obeys, that his love for God outweighs even his love for his son. And so he makes his way towards the altar and he uh, is prepared to sacrifice that which is most precious to him, his son who he loves. And on this Good Friday, we are trying to orient ourselves to remember and reflect on the fact that the cross represents for us the ultimate sacrifice birthed from a father's love. As we're told in perhaps the most famous passage in the Bible, John 3:16, For God so loved the world that he gave his son. It's because of his great love for us that God sent his son to die in our place on the cross. Yet at the very same time, it didn't come without pain. In an intimate moment with God in the garden, Jesus wrestles with the knowledge of what's going to happen to him in Luke chapter 22. And Jesus withdrew from his disciples about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, 
Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Being in utter agony to the point of sweating blood, Jesus begs God to remove the cup of suffering that's coming to him. But yet, because of his perfect unity with God the Father and his perfect unity with his will, he submits himself to what's going to happen. Ultimately, uh, knowing that the price to bring all of us back to God will cost him his life. He was obedient to the Father's will, even unto death. So if you have your bulletins, and if you don't have one, there's some at the back table there. Uh, we have some words printed out for uh, the song that we're going to sing together. How deep the Father's love for us. <laughs> On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And the, they went, both of them, together. So after three days of traveling, Abraham and Isaac arrive at the foot of the mountain on which the sacrifice is to be made. At this point, they separate themselves from the rest of their small party, and they begin to make their way up the mountain. Abraham holds in his hand the knife, the instrument of death, as well as the flint for the fire. And Isaac carries on his back the logs on which he will be laid 
Together they journey up the mountain, heading straight for a place of death. With Jesus, we see a very similar journey up a mountain. After he was convicted of crimes he didn't commit in John chapter 19. They took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which is in Aramaic called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Like Isaac, Jesus journeyed to a place of death, a place of a skull. Golgotha, and on his back he carried the tree, the instrument of his death. And there on that hill they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross, crucifying him like a criminal for all to see. One can only imagine what, would, what it would have been like to have seen it all happen. Especially to be someone who knew full well the significance of what was taking place. Undoubtedly, if you were there, it would be a moment that you'd probably have a hard time talking about for the rest of your life. And a moment that you would never forget. So I want us just to take a moment and, and reflect on the brutality of the cross and reflect on the suffering of Jesus and what he had to endure for our sake. So let's take a moment and reflect silently together. the moments leading up to the laying of Isaac on the altar, he asks his father a sobering question. He asks him, my father, and Abraham says, here I am. And he says, behold, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they both went up together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took out the knife to slaughter his son. As mentioned earlier, we sometimes picture Isaac as maybe a little boy in this moment, but by most accounts, he's probably a young man, maybe even 21 years old. And he asks his father a good question. Something's missing, Dad. We have the flint, we have the wood, we have the knife, but we don't have a lamb to kill. And notice how Abraham responds. He responds with a word of faith. He says, God himself will provide the lamb. Yet despite his faith being fixed on this hope, Abraham lays his son on the altar, and in this moment, he has his hand raised, and he's ready to do the deed. He's ready to slaughter his son. For the past three days, as, they, as they've been journeying towards this mountain, Isaac has been in Abraham's mind really good as dead. And now, in this moment, death is finally becoming a reality. Isaac has been forsaken, it seems, by both his God and his father. His life is over. The sacrifice is going to be made. Now, we know, if you know the story, that this is not how things end. We know that, that um, 
you know, what we're going to talk about Sunday is that Abraham was right, that God would provide the lamb, that ultimately Isaac would not die, that, this, that he would not be killed, but that God would provide a substitute in his place. And ultimately, we know that the substitute for Isaac and the substitute for all of us is Jesus, who's God himself. And unlike Isaac, Jesus would not be spared from death, but would undergo the full penalty of sin. In Matthew 27, we read that while he was on the cross, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Jesus hung on the cross, forsaken by his God and Father. And though he cried out in pain and had prayed for the cup to pass from him, and though the crowd watched to see if Elijah would come and save him, Jesus did not escape death. He breathed his last, and he yielded up his spirit. And the reason why we focus on this fact is to remind ourselves that Jesus, he needed to physically die. We know that the price for our sin is steep. It's a debt that on our own we cannot pay. And as troubling as the story of Isaac is for many of us, that a young man would be bound in an altar and, and offered to die, the fact of the matter is that we all deserve that fate. We all deserve to die to pay for our sin. Because the price of sin is death. Specifically eternity and hell. But by physically dying on the cross, Jesus served as the atoning sacrifice for us. Because he was both fully human and fully God, he could fully stand in our place and fully pay the price of sin. He was a man, yet he was God. And so he was perfect and without sin that corrupts and condemns the rest of us. And so I remember once again that verse, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his son for us. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If we believe in Jesus, we won't have to die. But we will have eternal life in heaven with him because of his broken body and his blood shed for us. And so we're going to be entering into a time of communion. We're going to have a time of reflection. And how this is going to work is Laura will play some music. We'll have a, a short time of reflection. And when you're ready, I want to invite you to take some time to reflect, to confess your sin, to come before Jesus, to remember the cross. And when you're ready, you can come up, take a cup, and take communion on your own. But before we do that, on the night of his betrayal, we are told that Jesus ate one last meal with his disciples. We're told that as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And after this, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So again, let's take a moment to pray, to confess our sins to Jesus. And when you're ready, you may come up and take uh, a cup and on your own partake in communion.
Jesus' body was broken and his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And so we can, even in the face of death, rejoice, knowing that Jesus paid it all. And so would you please sing now together, Jesus paid it all. After all had taken place at Jesus' crucifixion, we read of the finality of his death through the fact that he was buried. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it be given to him. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. His lifeless body was taken down. His body was laid in the tomb. And a great stone was rolled in front of it to ensure that no one could get in or out. And this is the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken long ago by the prophet Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man. i 